what have you done? What have you done now that you've been back home for the... You've had a weekend off. I've had a weekend off. It's... <laughs> Love Formula One, DH. But don't know what to do with yourself, do you? Yes. <laughs> One thing I wasn't doing was, did you see um, Lewis Hamilton was in Paris and he was partying with Kylian Mbappe and Neymar Jr. hanging out with all the Paris Saint-Germain oh my God. Uh, players yeah. at Cindy Bruner's party. So I wasn't there. Not that that's my thing anyway, but... I didn't know. I, fl I flicked through my Insta face on, on Twitter and... Uh, I saw a picture of him in a, in a, with a red backdrop and wearing very baggy clothes. And that's, that's really as much as I took in, Tom. Yeah, to well, that was en route, en route to, to, the me, to the mega party, yeah. Well, he lives his life, doesn't he? He really does enjoy himself when he's not actually racing a car. And I, I think that's really, you know, I think you should do more of that. What, h hanging out with Lewis or hanging out with Neymar? Exactly. Just turn up. Maybe you could do like a Dennis Penis thing. We talked about him. Hooray! <laughs> Two Dennis Penises in a row. I love that. Uh, should we get on with the show? Because we've got, yeah. we've got to hurry up. We've got a guest, a very special guest coming on. So, so yes, we've got... we have Alex Albon, next year's Williams star, joining us uh, very shortly, actually. Uh, oh. You're right. So let's let's kick off. This is official now. It's the Now this is the official part of the F1 Nation podcast. Welcome, listeners. And you're Damon Hill. And I'm Damon Hill. Yes, I am. That's uh, me. And that's Tom over there. Look. Oh, you can't see. There is Tom, <laughs> Tom Clarkson, who is looking refreshed after a weekend off. Well, these lay weeks in Formula One, Damon, this has been quite a quiet one, actually. I was just thinking, what news have we had since we did the show last week? And well, obviously Qatar. Qatar is now official. Race yeah. 20 in November. I'm excited about going there, actually. That's quite a string of races, isn't it? The US, uh, Mexico, Brazil, then Qatar. I mean, yeah. you took a pummeling just on the European races. I mean, three races on the trot. So, I mean, this is an, it's a really grueling schedule. Actually, you know, it's a really good point. So it's the third in that triple header of Mexico, Brazil, and then Qatar. How long, I don't even know how long a flight it is from from Brazil to Qatar, but it's going to be a long. How one, do you isn't do? It? It? I'm not sure you can get a direct flight from there to Qatar, but I mean, certainly have to Brazil. Yeah. I'm trying to get. I've got a mental picture of the world in my head now. You have to fly across Africa, basically. Do you think that's why they've delayed the start to six p.m. just in case if you, <laughs> there's any issues getting everyone over from Brazil? I tell you what, we'll give you an extra four hours. Oh dear. Night race though. Night race works over there, doesn't it? We, um, Bahrain. I saw the picture of the track. I mean, it's in the desert. I mean, it is, there's nothing around it. No, I don't think there is much because of course, Mo Mo <laughs> MotoGP, um, has raced there for, for many years, the Losai circuit. And it looks quick. I mean, it looked quick when you, when you're following a, a, a MotoGP rider. So these F1 cars are going to be sensational. There's, there's not really a, a, a slow, corner on the lap no. 16 quickish corners M mercedes track you think oh Maybe. i don't know i don't know Faster. mercedes or, or red bull what's it gonna be uh i think you can just roll the dice can't you well it'll be it'll be tight i mean we, we, we know it already is tight because we're we coming up to turkey and this is this time last year at turkey was where lewis claimed his seventh world title yeah and we're nowhere near that yet are we i mean you know he's got his seventh in the bag but the eighth is it's teetering on a very fine knife edge. Yeah, well, I think if, let's say, uh, Lewis has a two-point lead at the minute, and if Max were not to score at any of the remaining races, I still think the earliest that Lewis could claim the title is Brazil. So, and, and that's obviously not going to happen. The, com the Red Bull is too competitive. And so, yeah, yeah. I, I could see this going down to the wire. And what a what a what an amazing moment for the middle east the last what do we got we got four races in the middle east this year the last three are all there and um a world title is going to be decided at one of those venues so i might even be there i might even be there because i'm doing saudi as well and qatar that's what i'm due to and mexico and brazil but i might be doing those from the uk but but anyway it's getting to that critical moment it's not going to happen in turkey this time no but they've uh Last year was a fantastically exciting race, maybe for all the wrong reasons, because the tur they'd resurfaced it. But the cars had trouble keying onto the surface, even if it was dry, which it wasn't, basically. So they, they never got to find out if it was any good in the dry, I don't think. I think we had one dry practice session all weekend. 
And uh, do you remember the start? Just going down into turn one. Lance Stroll on pole position. God, he's good in those conditions, isn't he? Those mixed conditions and wet conditions. But going down into turn one, I think Bottas spun on his own. I think Ocon spun on his own. I mean, everyone spun on their own at some point in that race. It was. I think our, I think our guest spun as well. Oh, but did we, he? Maybe we should. I don't think we should mention yeah. that. Well, I'll leave that one to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 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 It's, I've done it. I've done it. We've all done it. Those conditions are the worst. They're so tricky. But it's also where people shine as well, because Lewis managed to eke out about 50 laps or something on a set of inters, which were everyone else was coming in and changing tires. And he just made it to the end and had a massive... Well, look, Damon, we'll talk, yeah. we'll talk all things turkey. We'll talk turkey with, um, <laughs> with Alex in a minute. It had to happen. But um, a couple of other bits of news. Martin Whitmarsh has now started at Aston Martin. First day was Friday, 1st of mm. October. He's now the boss of Aston Martin Performance Technologies. That's quite a grand title, isn't it? And isn't it great to have him back in Formula One? Because we haven't seen him since 2014. Whippy, as he was affectionately called. Um, and he, was, he came in at a very interesting time at McLaren, didn't he? There was a little bit of a boardroom struggle, I think, uh, sort of arm wrestling match between him and Ron, other the way McLaren was run. And I think um, neither of them there survived that one. Um, so uh, McLaren's gone on to different things, but his expertise, as I understand it, was you know, he was from aerospace was he british aerospace i think originally yeah he is an engineer by trade yeah he's yeah so he he understands manufacturing processes and, and management organization and, and let's be honest if you've got, if you're going to build road cars and racing cars then you need to uh, delegate some key people in the right pe right places and he's been busy since he left mclaren in 2014 as the ceo of the ineos americas cup team so he's got experience outside although he did what was it, 25, 30 years at McLaren, he's now got experience outside. So when Aston Martin wants to use its technical expertise and its new factory that's going to be ready in a couple of years' time, he's well-placed to start selling that into other industries like the worlds of, of yachting and, and all sorts of other places. So exciting times. They, you know, you can't escape. It is Hotel California, isn't it, Formula One? You know, you can check out, but you... You can't leave that sort of thing. And uh, so he's back. And I, I think I heard a good quote. I don't know where I saw it. It was a clip with um, Ken Tyrrell. And he said, people never leave Formula One. He said, it's like a disease. You know, it gets in your blood and, and they just stay forever and ever. So that'd probably be me. <laughs> oh, and you, Tom. You, you, there's no leaving for you. you. You're fully invested. Well, you left and came back, didn't you? I did. I left. I left and came back. And uh, it's I'm enjoying it. I actually say, I, 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 I'll be honest, I'm, you know, it is gripping in, in it's kind of compelling and kind of it's a story. It's a it's soap opera, isn't it? Let's, let's be honest. It's a story that never ends. So anyway, Martin Whitmarsh, he's back and he's going to organise and probably have to deal with Lawrence Stroll. And uh, that's going to be tough because yeah. he seems to strike me as a man who maybe we should have him on the show, Lawrence Stroll, because he strikes me as a man who knows what he wants and he's not happy until he gets it. Right, hang on a second, Damon. We're talking new territory for Martin Whitmarsh at Aston Martin. Well, let me introduce Manscaped's new territories because they've just taken off in the USA, Canada. They're in the UK, of course, and now across Europe, Australia, South Africa and Singapore. So our great mates at Manscaped are absolutely flying at the moment. And here's why. They've just launched the Performance Package 4.0. Oh, now this is why you're going to like it, Damon. It features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. All sounds very Formula One, doesn't it? It's waterproof, so you can use it in the shower. And it also has a 4000K LED spotlight that you can turn on and off when needed for a little bit more of a precise shave. So Damon, it's not just for that goatee beard. But it's not only that as well. They've also got the Weed Whacker as part of their performance package 4.0. Quick resume of that. It's a, a powerful tool armed with a 9000 RPM motor powered 360 degree rotary dual blade system. Sounds pretty snazzy, doesn't it? And how can I forget? You'll also get Manscaped's signature crop preserver 
full deodorant. Now, note to self, that is something I think I really need to try. And if and if that's not enough, how about their Crop Reviver Bull Toner? A soothing aloe vera and witch hazel blend to keep you cool after a shave. They'll also throw in two free gifts, a pair of performance boxer briefs and a travel bag to keep all of your kits safe. So if you want some of this performance package 4.0 from Manscaped, get 20% off and free shipping with the code F1Nation at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code F1Nation at manscaped.com. I am told that we have a Formula One driver waiting to speak to us. Alex Albon in the waiting room. Should we let him in? Of course we should. Yeah. Get him in, Tom. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Alex, lovely to have you on the show. And uh, it's great. We got, we got loads of questions. A lot of listeners who uh, want to know what your life is like now and preparing. And now you've obviously signed up for actual driving again. How excited you are about that. Yes, very exciting. My life right now is actually busier than it has been last year and the year before, which is crazy to think, you know, coming into Formula One, it's already a busy schedule. But this year with DTM and all the simulator work I'm doing, it's hectic because I'm basically at a racetrack. I've been at a racetrack almost every week for, for six, seven months now. I've, I've had one week off in six six months and it's just been visiting, going around, driving, all that kind of thing. Alex, that's amazing. I mean, do you still love being at racetracks with that kind of schedule? Or <laughs> Yeah, honestly, especially at the start of the year, no, I didn't enjoy it. Like, you can imagine when you're watching cars go around and you're not driving. I don't know how you feel, Damon, but for me, it's, it's that kind of itch where you're just like... Ugh. It'll do you good. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's been pretty useful because it's kind of a backseat look at things and, and almost like a... You can look things on a very external point of view where you're, you know, when you're racing, you're, you're so in the moment all the time. And when, you, when you're when you at a racetrack and you're not so focused on the driving since, since you're not doing any, but you're looking how the team operates, how the drivers are, and you can really start to pick out and understand, you know, the experience of, of, of different drivers and, and picking it out and also just learning. I, I treat it as a learning process as well, seeing how, what could I have done and, and better you know, last year and, and what can I do for next year that can that can help me in the process. Have you spent quite a bit of time analysing the opposition as well? Yes. I mean, a lot of the stuff I do now is, is studying the opposition because especially on the simulator, we're, what we do is we, we're pretty much looking at where we're strong, where we're weak, especially, of course, where we're weak, looking at other cars and studying them, seeing why are they quicker than us through certain corners, what do they have which we don't. And it, it doesn't need to be just, obviously, grip sounds an easy one, but there's a lot of things with even lines, curb riding, track usage, or even before a corner, it could be how, how much are they using the tyres in, in the previous corner, that kind of thing. You get a pretty good idea of everyone's weaknesses and, and strengths. Do you get the sense that, you know, it's given you time to breathe? Because F1, when, once you get into it, it all goes at, you know, flat out pace in every direction. And sometimes you get the sense you can't quite get on top of it. I mean, with this break you've been afforded, it might be to your advantage in some ways because of this. You know, you can take a step back and kind of go, okay, I suddenly, now I've got time to do my homework a bit. I'd say, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. It, it, when you, especially the career path I had where it was, I was in Toro Rosso for six months and then straight into the big team. You do lack a lot of experience when you go progress that quickly. The testing that we have now is nowhere near as big as what, it was like back in the day. So there's a lot of catch up to do and you, you get put into that circus, the, the F1 circus, which is flat out. There's a lot of things going on. And on top of the driving, there's all the, all the media, all the external things that go on. And uh, it's more about also just maturing, you know, in that year that goes past, you can look back and reflect a lot on how can you handle things better in certain situations and get prepared for next year. I do have a theory that, that drivers who've had like a good trajectory and then suddenly it all goes wrong and they drop back down the you know snakes and ladders it's a bit like you go down the snake then they're a stronger driver they actually improves them they get hungrier they get more determined and they get more they, they appreciate 
every opportunity they get. Damon, a, a case in point is Fernando Alonso, who, who made his debut with Minardi in 2001 and then had to sit on the sidelines in 2002, comes back in 2003 with Renault and start. he became the youngest ever Grand Prix winner that year. And well, look, look what happened after that. Indeed. And now it's Williams. This is There's a bit of a, a struggle. There seems to be a, a sort of tug of war going on a little bit with you, uh, Red Bull, maybe not wanting you to go to Williams and... Toto not wanting you in there, or how did that work? What was the what was the, <laughs> you've managed to be shoehorned into into an, a team that's not a Red Bull team? You're putting me on the spot there, Damon. I am. Um, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do here. You didn't think this was going to be easy. Uh, <laughs> um, you can tell us. We'll only tell how many listeners do we have, Tom? James, <laughs> uh, just just us lot, yeah. We're, we're not. We're not. We're, 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 we're stays in the podcast. But it's nice to be uh, wanted. Good. I mean, you know, you got two people yes. want you by the sounds of yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. It, it it was good. It was um, it was nice to firstly, obviously, have the opportunity, and and obviously with Williams, they they looking at the way they're going. It's mightily impressive, and you know, with all the investment coming in as well into the team, it's exciting to be a part of. How it happened, it's yeah. I don't want to obviously go into too too much detail, but honestly, everything. There's a lot of talk, but actually everything happened. And on my side, it was relatively straightforward. It was with Williams, it was meeting Yoss and everyone and all the external stuff. I'm not really involved in it. It's between the power players, let's say, and I kind of do my thing and, and that's it. You're just a pawn. You're just a pawn in this massive, you know, game of power and uh, race teams. And it's, yeah. In a way, it's nice though, because, you know, you're, you're wanted and... Um, yeah, it was a good feeling to be able to to have that choice where or that choice, that option to be back in Formula One. Alex, I think you're joining Williams at the perfect time. You know, they came in that that Doralton yes. investment late last year, before the budget cap came in, they they transformed the factory, brought in a whole load of new machinery, didn't they? And now they've been investing in staff and I mean, hey Damon, you know, an, a Williams old boy to a Williams new boy. What advice have you got for Alex? <laughs> well, I think in the old days I could have given Alex some advice, but I think it's such a new team, a new dynamic now, and in you know, under new management is 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 a euphemism. I mean, it is completely different. Looks like a different mindset. Um, I actually was actually with uh, Jost in the queue. Uh, to go out of Russia because it's quite a long kind of process of uh, security and God knows what, knows what. But anyway, got a chance to, to chat with him a little bit. And um, he's one of these, uh, I mean, he's maybe my age. Um, is that delicately put enough? I mean, so, you know, but he's <laughs> he's motivated. I mean, he's a racer. He, he You can see he's pushing, shoving. He wanted to get ahead of me in the queue, but I had to block him. <laughs> 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 Elbows out. Once a racer, always a racer, Damon. <laughs> he's an impressive character, Yoss, though, isn't he? How have you found him, Alex? Yes, he's been um, he's been great. I, I feel like there's a. I don't know if you picked it up, Damon, but there's a huge energy within him. Yeah. I, I don't know if you you guys feel that, but there's a lot of motivation within the team. I feel like there's this big, just yeah, overall positivity with it, within everyone. And if you talk to any of the guys at the factory, it's all you know. It all, all feels like there's that buzz around which is really nice and you know it is a, it is a, a close family team everyone's very friendly and it, it is very approachable and uh and yes as you said it, it the timing feels like it's it's going up and up of course with the new regulations next year it does put everything on a reset but um it feels like we're in a good position to jump on that and, and see how it goes did you have any heroes who drove for williams when you were young that's a good question that's a good question He's too. He doesn't even remember when well, I was. Actually, I mean, he was born. The <laughs> Alex, when were you born? Ninety-six. Yeah, sorry. so I was kind of out of the um, great year. Great year. The, the, the golden era of Damon and 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 all that kind of stuff. So actually, if you think about it, my hero was was Michael. So the direct competitor being Montoya. I'll get my coat and everyone. <laughs> I was. I, I saw. I have you visited the uh, the museum? The museum is amazing, and uh, so I was basically walking around the, the museum, thinking like this was the guy who I wanted to uh, to lose, you know. Hmm. But it was nice to see. It was nice to see. Well, you know, there's a little story about that because they had originally they had the car that was tapped by Michael in um, in Adelaide in 94 and it, and it, they had preserved they had preserved the on the side pod the tyre marks 
And no then, way. then one day they had a new cleaner who came in who thought they'd do a better <laughs> job of cleaning the car than the last person <laughs> and cleaned it off. Um, so that was a bit of a history, a bit of history that's been lost. Oh, dear. Um, oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> that got kind of awkward there. I love it. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I t- listen, you wanted me to lose. I can take that. That's what racing's all about. It's, it's about passionate. But you, I mean, yeah, it's great that you've gone to this place that's got history. And it was interesting. You, you're actually slotting into quite a hot seat because people are going to now make comparisons between you and your old mucker, George. You know, how, how it's, that's going to be a bit strange, isn't it? Because he's moved on and you're going into his seat and you guys have been kind of dancing around each other's careers haven't you all all the way from karting yeah we've we've been racing each other since we were nine years old pretty much whatever we did if it was formula three formula two we were always pretty much next to each other on the grid which was uh yeah we became good friends and coming into f1 together as well was was a pretty special thing but you know in terms of comparisons or anything like that i mean i think it's more the media and the external people that pick that up but on our side you know everything changes so much. You've got uh, George going to a Mercedes and I think there's always these connecting dots going on externally, but for us, it's just with different cars and different everything, different regulations, it's it's kind of a reset. And it, for me, actually, it's actually a positive thing because I think it, you know, it, it can sometimes be dif- difficult for drivers to spend a year out of a season, but when you reset, it kind of reshuffles everything and um, everyone starts afresh. Well, you mentioned new regulations. Have you driven a simulated uh, 2022 car? Uh, Red Bull, yes. Ah. <laughs> For Williams, no. Not right. yet, no. What's the Red Bull like? What does it feel like? Well, the, the thing is, is like you, you kind of get given the aero numbers, predicted downforce. You set up the car for that. And in the end of it, you know, you get a good balance. You know, you work with the engineers and you set up the car accordingly. And the car feels feels good, as, as any car does. Does it feel slower? It does feel slower. Yeah, I mean... I would love to be able to say, oh, it's the same pace or we're going quicker, but that would be a lie. And maybe the, maybe a good thing. We can scare the other people around, <laughs> the, the other teams, but um, it is at least for now slower. A lap of Silverstone, how much slower? Oh, roughly, no, roughly. I, I, I just know if I say this, I'll give a number and then, okay. and then they'll be like, okay, okay, okay. Where is it slower? Oof, where is it slower? <laughs> corners. I mean, firstly, be, firstly be, quick corners. <laughs> corners. Is it traction? Is it? Uh, okay, yeah. this is it. it. Corners and straights. No, I'm joking. Yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, that's the big insight. It's it's different. It's slightly heavier. We know with the tires actually weigh quite a lot, and it's more the feeling of the car because the the tires change the feeling of of these this new eighteen inch tires. Without going into too much detail, it's stiff on the sidewalls, so the uh, the tire flexes differently and that gives a different feeling for the car. But, you know, at the end of it, it's all maximized in terms of the car. So when you drive it, even on the simulator, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like something strange. You drive the limit of whatever the limit is, don't you? Exactly. You know, so whatever kind, the only problem I'd say is that going backwards for a racing driver is always more difficult than going forwards. They, they love more horsepower. They love more downforce. They love a better balance. You know, when you go backwards and have a reset, I mean, in, when I was driving, they bought in the groove tires. So in 98, they brought in groove tires. Oh my God, I hated those things. It was just horrible. You know, going back, this car was just mushy and unresponsive. And yeah, I've, I struggled with going backwards. Alex, can you simulate running close to another car and the effect it has on, on you, the, the follower? That would be cool. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should work, work, work with Red Bull, Tom. Um, but no, we haven't. I think a lot of that stuff is a little bit of a toss-up. On paper, it looks like it's going to work. The one thing which I would say, though, is that if you see how the regulations have played out these last few years, we've, had, we've kind of gone from the... When was the last iteration? 2017? It's when they went, yeah, wider and mm. when they went into wider and, and them kind of cars, and then we've spent five years on on this car, and it's basically brought the teams closer and closer because there's a, at the end of the day, there's, there's yeah. not much more you can do. You know, you got, you're getting Williams now making Q3s, and you know at the beginning of 2017 there were these huge gaps between everyone, so it was almost like Mercedes, Mercedes, Ferrari, Ferrari, Red Bull, Red Bull. You know, it was a kind of like that kind of stagger or lack of stagger where it was just um, very consistent between the grid and i'm thinking we'll see come next year but the overtaking might be better but it might take a little bit of time for the for the teams to all mix up and, and get close maybe we'll have an amazing year like was it 2012 where you got 
different winners every every weekend but yeah first seven races yeah exactly that would be amazing but i think that's the only thing that i'm thinking of next year is the overtaking and the closeness of racing might be good but maybe there will be less interference because teams will have their own pace you know well, we hope that's not going to happen. I mean, that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, re- I'm not really selling it. For- the regulations are very tight, but you know, you're absolutely right because over, you know, over a period of regulations, then people find all the loopholes, and there's less and less to find, so they get closer. And and we you know have having a fantastic season this year. Um, who do you think is going to win it? Then, uh, as a Red Bull driver who's split between Mercedes and Red Bull now, who's going to win? Who is going <laughs> to win this year's champion? Is it going to be a Mercedes? Or- I have my Red Bull cap on, obviously. I mean, I have to. I can't hide hide the biasness. I would say it's going to go down to the last race. I'm I'm pretty confident about that. Yeah, I, I want to say I want to say Red Bull. I, I mean, we're pushing hard, of course. Like like Mercedes are looking at the tracks. It's pretty fifty fifty. I would say going into who favors what circuit. What What about this weekend, Alex? Turkey this weekend. I'm interested to see the the track first of all. Last year, that was unbelievable. In terms of conditions, I actually really enjoyed it because it was so, so weird to drive a thousand horsepower on a track where you're pretty much dancing and uh, on an ice rink. The curbs were grippier than the tarmac. So we were driving around, like trying to touch all the curbs. If you look at the races, we're all clipping the the curbs everywhere because they had a bit more grip than than the track. And I loved that. I thought that was so weird but so cool at the same time. That didn't come up on the simulator, did it? <laughs> that didn't. Honestly, it's, it's, we, we did some sim prep not long ago for Turkey and the amount of grip you have to take off for the track to get the lap times that we're predicting is just, it's, it doesn't feel real. But yeah, that, that's kind of how it is. And it's because of that, it, it dices up the, the order and I think it's more just about what team can get the tyres working. I think Red Bull, we do a pretty good job with that. So I think we'll be, we'll be pretty good. Hang on, guys, quick interlude here, because I want to give you my weekly reminder to check in on your health. I've certainly shared some of my ailments with you on the show. Remember Baku? And it's important that we talk about these things, because did you know that one in four guys suffers from gut health issues like irritable bowel syndrome, abdominal pain and bloating? And if any of that rings a bell to you, then we recommend Sun's Live Bacteria Supplement. It's clinically proven to treat digestive troubles and to improve your gut health. Because remember, 70% of your immune system is in your gut. So gut health is vital to your general health and wellness because it helps fight viruses and other illnesses. Not only that, it's backed up by over 50 clinical trials, making it one of the most studied bacteria in the world and was effective in helping 8 out of 10 men with their gut health issues in one study. So check it out at suns.co.uk and use the code F1Nation25 to get £25 off your first order. That's F1Nation25 to get £25 off your first order. Guys, where were we? I've got a quick question about as a driver in Red Bull, in the big team. I was saying that younger drivers might have had more pressure on them than, say, someone like Sergio Perez, because Sergio's been around a bit and he can stand up to people like, you know, Helmut Marco and and Christian. Is it really brutal in there? Is it, it, do you get the sense that all the attention's going on to Max? What what happens for a, a guy who's joining the big team in Red Bull? Yeah, I think there's a misconception about it, truthfully speaking. I think that, you know, the, there is, of course, that villain role played, I think, within the media about it all. But it's definitely not as nowhere near as like that, basically. Helmet you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, I would say, I mean, you guys know more than I do. I think Helmet must really gets given the worst role out of on, on the global side of it. But I think it's just Red Bull in general. I mean, they're hardcore. They're a hardcore team, aren't of they? Of course. I think, firstly, you have, you have to realise, like, they're a winning team. You know, they expect good results and um, it's the culture within the team if we're not winning we're not happy and I think that's that's kind of how it should be really especially you know the top th- well, top three teams generally being Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes they, that's that's kind of what they expect of course it is tough especially when when you don't have much experience to be in, in a top top team but yeah it, that, that is what it is I think more more than anything it's just trying to get confident with the car Do you ever tell them to get stuffed if they put too much pressure on you? Well the thing is, is like it, it's not like there's this thing where 
you got to do this. If you don't do this, that's it. Pack your bags kind of thing. It's very much like, of course, they want both cars to do well. That's that's the whole intention. You don't want, you're not going to put pressure on someone if they're not performing because firstly, the media do enough of that. And especially talking about myself, I put myself under the most pressure. It's it's no one else that can, isn't, there's no added benefit on the outside. So yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. I think, as I said, it's more just the way that the car runs quickly or is quick is not as easy for, let's say, you know, Checo myself than it, than it is for Max. Damon, has a racing driver ever told his boss to get stuffed? Does that well, we used to do? They used to do it all the time. Don't forget when in the <laughs> did you ever tell stuff, Patrick Head lot, to get stuffed? I, I I got out of the car and gave him the steering wheel once. I said, "You drive it." <laughs> <laughs> he was on my he was on my case. I was only like ten minutes into the first session at Spa, and I was like, he came over and was. He was very pumped up, but um, we, we loved. What, what, why, what, what was the situation? There? Oh, I don't know. He got he got upset about something, but you know he was in, he was very impatient, Patrick. So um, he liked to. Uh, uh, and there's a great interview that um, Tom has done with him, and he's he's a fantastic man. I mean, I have absolutely you know enormous respect for him, but you know he didn't always choose his moment. <laughs> 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 but I mean, I'm saying that because, you know, if you go back to, let's say, the 80s, a lot of the drivers were the same age or even older than the guys who ran the team. So I always oh, really? think it's quite difficult for, you know, we have someone who's uh, as experienced as someone like Helmut Marko or Christian or whatever. I mean, Christian's still quite young, but, you know, when you've got guys like Ron Dennis, and you've got 20 year olds, it's very difficult to stand yeah. up to them. And you look at yeah. someone like Fernando Alonso. Fernando went a little bit too far, but Fernando didn't take any nonsense, even if you were the boss. You know, he stood his ground. And I think that that is, with some tough teams, someone like Red Bull, I think they only respect people who are very tough with them. Give us your schedule, for example, in Turkey this weekend. Do you come to the track or are you back in Milton Keynes on the sim? It depends. So let's say, like, let's say I can take Russia, for instance, as, as the last race that I did. Most of it is I'll be doing my DTM duty. So I'll finish on a Sunday normally. Um, Monday, I get off. Pretty much Tuesday, Wednesday, um, we're back on the sim. So Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll be working more on next year's car. That's kind of where we... A lot of the work now is kind of 50-50, actually. It's almost like we've got these artificial updates on the car, which kind of come in. Obviously, it's predicted numbers and all that kind of funky stuff. And then the Thursday and the Friday will be preparation for the real car for the weekend. So... We have all these lovely setups to choose from. We'll basically keep trying to find lap time within the simulator. And at that point, we kind of say, okay, this is this works, this works, this works. This is the different aero wing levels we can run. This is better for the qualifying, this is better for the race. This is what we want to be doing if it's wet, all that kind of stuff. And then Friday, Friday is the fun day, actually. I quite enjoy Fridays because we're pretty much getting live towards FP1, FP2. I'm in the simulator as well. So we're watching the onboards, watching the feedback, trying to correlate the data as quickly as possible because there's only a short amount of time before we've got to get the same balance. Because of course, on the simulator and on track, it's not quite the same. There's always that little bit of discrepancy in balance and, and even lap time as well. You know, Maybe the track's a bit grippier. Like Turkey, no one could predict the track to be 15 seconds off the pace. So during those sessions, Alex, it's as if Red Bull has three cars on track. They're the two real ones. And at the same time, in real time, you're doing the sessions as well back yes. in Milton Keynes. Wow. On top of that, you know, you have Max and Checo with different driving styles. So what's important is more about listening to the feedback they give because I can match the car quite similar to track, but then Max likes quite a loose rear end, so he will rarely complain about rear instability. Um, and he might just want a bit more front in certain places or he wants something here, something there. So we'll chase that. We'll find that for him. And the engineers, you know, Simon Rennie, who's, who's, who was my engineer last year, He's my engineer on the simulator as well. Um, he'll relay that to, to Max's engineer. They'll do their little thing and then we'll do Checo as well. Checo has different issues, so we'll, we'll find that for him and then we'll put it in his car for FP2 and then that's kind of how it works. And then I pretty much, I get a flight Saturday morning, a silly time up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. And, uh, and that's where you see me at the racetrack. And I'm kind of just knackered. <laughs> yeah, flown in, uh, flown in, and then like yeah. poor bloke leaning up in the back of the garage, like <laughs> with a cup of coffee, trying to keep his eyes open. God. Hey, Damon, why were you shaking your head when Alex was describing Max enjoying a, a loose rear end? What was that all about? Oh, I hate those drivers. 
the ones that like the roof's rear end. I hate them. I don't understand it. I do not understand it. And oh god, no, it's horrible. <laughs> Alex, it's 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 a huge moment for you to come back into Formula One, and I know so many people are wishing you luck. So best of luck with it all next year and good luck for the remainder this year bring the championship home yes yes thank you yes we're, we're working hard before you go have you got just five minutes because we have some listeners questions it's ask damon lovely yeah they, they set me up here i basically they've set up this thing it's called ask damon and then you can blame him if it will go wrong <laughs> Well, let's fire away then. Here is question one. Okay. Hi, Damon. Hayden here from Milton Keynes. I've always wanted to know, with all the travel needed in Formula One, does a team look after a driver's passport? Or is that something else the driver needs to think about during the weekend? Have you ever turned up to the airport and realised you can't find yours? Thanks and love the show. Hayden in Milton Keynes, we've got just the man who knows all about Milton Keynes and passports. <laughs> uh, I am useless. I actually have a funny story about losing my passport. This year, I was doing a, an interview for Austrian TV and uh, first time meeting a lot of the big guys at Red Bull Austria, which I've never actually met before. It's kind of the first time I've visited uh, the main factory. And I uh, went to one of, their, uh, one of the people's houses to his apartment, took off my jacket, that kind of thing. We had dinner and I had to leave my hotel at 3 a.m. to catch this flight. And uh, I left my passport in my jacket, which I left the jacket at his house. I called him, called him, called him, called him. And it, I didn't, obviously, I don't really want to call someone that senior, um, but I had to. To say you've been a numpty and left your passport. You can't even get, you can't even look after yourself when you're uh, traveling. Exactly. What makes this even funnier is this was the day I was signing my contract with Williams. I was like, I have to, I have to be there. Like, I can't, I can't wait or go to an embassy or anything like that. I, I really need to fly that day. I called him, called him, and he didn't pick up. Obviously, he was sleeping. <laughs> so, so I was like, what do I do? What do I do? So I, I remembered, okay, I know where his address is. Got the taxi to go to his, his place. Got to this apartment building and was like buzzing the door. But he was still sleeping. Luckily, there was someone from the apartment walking into his building complex at like 3.30 in the morning at that point. So I, I, I go in behind them. And I'm literally just knocking on his door <laughs> until he wakes up <laughs> and uh, say, hey, hey, uh, his name's Max. I was like, hey, Max. He's like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I think I left my passport in your, in your apartment. And he's like, no, you didn't leave your jacket here. You left it at the, um, <laughs> at the, at the TV studio. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> so <laughs> then I had to go to the TV studio and I was so lucky that there was a security guard there and he had all the keys to all the places and I could get my jacket and I was on my way. One of those lovely moments that you get as a race, you know, I mean, yeah, we, we, we all have been in tight spots to catch flights. Uh, that's a fact. I've, I've banged on the door for them to open the plane up again, <laughs> but that was about as close as, I've, uh, yes. close as I've got to missing them. I don't know about you guys, I tend to carry around two passports because, um, you know, when we go to China, we need a visa. And when we go to Russia, we need a visa and then we need a passport whilst that's getting all done at the embassy, blah, 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 blah. But generally speaking, we're in control of our own things, which is not good. I've, I've, I've lost my driver's license two weeks ago. What, speeding? Speeding? No, no, what were you doing? just lost it. Just oh, physically lost it. Physically lost it, which has been a nightmare because I'm traveling so much and now I can't get a rental car. Ugh, it's terrible. Well, I'm like uh, Alex, we have uh, two passports and you probably have the same because of the visa thing. So it's not because we're international man of mystery and trying to dodge, uh, you know, dodge our way <laughs> through the, the customs. But it's, it's the same bloke. It's just a different number. And the, and the trick is when you book a flight, you have to remember which passport you're going to be flying on. Oh, yes. I never missed a flight in my life. I've come very, very close. I missed a train. <laughs> I took my family to Paris and I took them on the train and I got to the train station at sort of seven o'clock in the evening to go home. And they said, no, your, your train was seven o'clock this morning. I had to rebuy tickets and stuff. So, <laughs> Oh, wonderful. OK, well, Hayden, thank you for your question. And our second question 
G'day F1 Nation, Matt here from Sydney. Just had a question about Oscar Piastri, who's currently in F2. He won the 2019 Formula Renault, he then won the Formula 3, and he's currently dominating in Formula 2. How is it that such a young gun could potentially miss out on a seat in F1? Looking forward to your insight, mate. Uh, have a good one. Okay, Matt, I can relate to the, the problem of getting into F1 because it's not always about talent. And sometimes, you know, you just have to be in the right place in the right time. But um, Oscar Piastri, Alex, have you got any comment on... I mean, it's difficult talking about uh, other drivers, isn't it? And, yeah. yeah. Oscar, he's, he's obviously a very talented driver and I think he will get his chance in Formula 1. I think, um, you know, when you look at the situation of the paddock, it's that age-old thing where it's, you know, it, it takes a lot of skill, but it also takes a bit of luck and timing. And when I got into Formula 1, there was this huge... Actually, it was probably, was it Daniel going to Renault that triggered this whole market opening? And, you know, the market just went crazy and suddenly there were all these seats available in Formula 1. There was three of us, three Formula 2 drivers going into to F1 that year, which is kind of unheard of. I think partly it's because of going into a new year, new regulations. I think teams maybe tend to lean towards the experience side as the new cars come in and it's a lot more about developing the car as quickly as you can. Um, but also, so it's just purely the timing of it. It's one of them things where there aren't many seats going out right now. I mean, of course, I'm very fortunate and I and I have one of them. I think the other one is Alfa Romeo. With Alfa Romeo, you know, they have their own junior team. Oscars with Alpine. Sauber have their own junior drivers as well. They have Porsche, who's very quick and also knocking on the doorstep of Formula One. So it's very tricky. There has to be a few spaces open. And of course, it's always good as well to have a little bit of funding whoever it is, your home country or, or sponsors or, or whatever it is, to make that extra step into Formula 1. And Oscar's situation isn't helped by the fact that Alpine doesn't have any customer teams, customer engine teams this year, does it? So it's not like they can't do a deal with a team um, on his behalf. So Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. If you look at it, I see Red Bull have Alfa Tori. You then have Ferrari, who have looks more like Haas now as, as the new kind of junior team that they have. You have Mercedes who tend to have a lot of infrastructure within within other teams. So you have, let's say, Esteban at, at the time, Force India. You had George at Williams. And as you said, once um, Re Renault or Alpine, they, they, they're they kind of a one-man band. So it is very tricky. And I think I, I would be frustrated too if I was Oscar. And he's the real deal, isn't he? He's won the last two feature races in Formula 2. So Matt from Sydney just be patient he will get there and he's got Mark Webber fighting his corner as well and, and Mark knows everybody so it's only a matter of time <laughs> Alex it's been fab to have you on the show thank you so much for your Lovely. time really good and best of luck with everything the remainder of this year of course and everything that comes your way with Williams as well thank you I'll see you in Turkey if you don't miss your flight yeah <laughs> <laughs> alright guys see you later nice talking Alex cheers Damon, isn't he a nice guy? You just want him to do well. Want him yeah. to do well. Alex is such a pleasant chap to, to have in your team. He looks too easy going. He's not easy going on the track, obviously. He's, he's feisty and a, a great driver. But um, once you've had, you know, that fantastic opportunity in F1 and then you've had it snatched away from you and you've had to sit out a year, I don't, I don't know if make you hungrier. I, I loved his a week in the life of Alex Albon as well. You know, he starts... He's allowed a day off on, on a Monday after racing in the DTM and then Tuesday, Wednesday is 2022 stuff and then Thursday, Friday is current stuff and then he flies out to the track at 3 a.m. You kind of hope that Max Verstappen and Orcheco doesn't slip over in the shower because he's not going to be in a fit state to, to, to race a car. Is <laughs> yes, slight problem with your reserve driver. He's, a, he's asleep. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, it's going to be a very tight fight in Turkey this weekend, isn't it? Very quickly, Damon, what do you think is going to happen? Who's your money in? I have to say, I think you're going to get a wheel-to-wheel ding-dong battle between, you know, Max and, and Lewis. I just can't see it happening any other way. I mean, are the, are the McLarens going to be in there? I mean, th this is now getting a little bit tight for the guys at the front. There's some other guys snipping at the heels. So, yeah, lots of good stuff to come. And are Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo going to start having an impact on this world championship fight between Lewis and Max? Well, all to play for Turkish Grand Prix this weekend. We can't wait. So that was it, Tom. That was the Turkey pre-Turkey edition 
of <laughs> F1 Nation. Brought to you by F1 in association with Audio Boom. See you.